All right. Welcome to our second lecture in uh, Module 4 uh, in our online cognition course. Uh, today we're going to be talking about classic research in short-term memory. Uh, in the sort of unitary construct version of short-term memory we talked about last time uh, in the atkinson schifrin model, these are classic areas of research. We'll talk in uh, the upcoming lectures about working memory as a sort of multi um, construct version of uh, shorter term forms of memory, but this research we'll talk about today is an important component of that, uh, and it certainly is how we got to where we are today in talking about working memory. So what we'll talk about today is we'll first talk about the mechanism of forgetting from short term memory. Now, just by way of review, remember, when we're talking about short term memory, we're talking about what has happened in about the last 30 seconds or so. Um, anything beyond 30 seconds is longer term memory or long term memory. Uh, and so we're talking about immediate forms of memory, uh, information that's gotten past sensory memory that we are working on in our shorter term memory. So basically you can almost think of this as about whatever is consciously going on in your head at the time as you generally sort of what we were mean as short term memory. And again, it goes back at, at about 30 seconds or so. So we'll talk about uh, first the mechanism of forgetting, that is how do we, how does information get lost from short term memory. We'll then talk about what's the nature of the code, that is how is information encoded in short term memory, is it auditory, is it visual, is it, you know, what is it. And then we'll finally finish up by talking about the capacity of short term memory. So let's start with the mechanism of forgetting. The first thing we have to do is uh, introduce the concept of inter interference versus decay. Interference is going to become important later on when we talk about different forms of longer term memory. Um, but we'll talk about interference versus decay and then I'm going to talk about three different experiments uh, that are very classic experiments in this area. Uh, in particular, uh, Peterson and Peterson and also Brown uh, in what's called the Brown-Peterson task. Then we'll talk about a clever study by Keppel and Underwood and then another by Wickens and colleagues. So let's start by talking about interference versus decay. Decay is pretty simple. According to this view, information simply disappears from short-term memory. It decays. Uh, it's formally defined as the spontaneous loss of information over time. So you see something and then it just disappears if it's not maintained. So one of the things uh, we talked about with the modal model or the atkinson schifrin model is that um, you can rehearse information in short-term memory. And so anything that's not rehearsed will either be um, lost by decay or interference. And the first theory is that it just decays, spontaneously lost over time. Interference is, uh, holds that there is competition among information. That is when old information interferes with new information, you experience proactive information. Sorry, pro, sorry proactive interference. Um, and so anything that is that is older, that is interfering with your interfering with your ability to learn new information. We call that proactive interference. When new information is interfering with old information, we call that retroactive interference. We'll talk about this in terms of uh, the easier way to think about this is is uh, just kind of in terms of uh, longer term memory. So let's say you studied Spanish in high school and you're studying Italian in college. So you're trying to learn Italian now. Well, that Spanish you learned earlier may interfere with your ability to learn Italian now. That would be proactive interference because it is moving forward in time from its previous. So old information interfering with new is proactive interference. Retroactive interference occurs when new information interferes with old information. So now you've been learning Italian in college, but you learned Spanish in high school, and you go to Mexico for spring break, and now you try to say something and half of it comes out in Italian. That's because that new Italian is causing retroactive interfer active interference for your memory for Spanish. Now, we generally talk in short-term memory uh, primarily about proactive interference because there's just not enough, really, not enough time to get to retroactive interference. But uh, after a number of uh, short-term memory trials, you can get, get what's called the buildup or proactive interference, and we'll talk about that here in just a moment. So decay, information is just disappearing. Interference is, as you're doing new short-term memory tasks, the old stuff, it starts to build up and it's pushing out your ability to learn anything new. So that gets us to Peterson and Peterson. And again, similar research conducted by Brown. In fact, what we're talking about now is called the Brown-Peterson task. They presented participants with three consonants that they were to remember. So something like this, CHJ. That was then followed by a number. Participants were then asked to count backwards by threes from that number. 
So if it was 100, it would be 97, 94, 91, 88, 85, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, that counting backwards was called, or is called, a distractor task, and that is to keep participants from rehearsing those letters. So remember, this is short-term memory. If all they had to do was hang on to those three letters and we didn't give them something else to do, this would be, there'd be no challenge at all. Everyone would get 100% because they could just sit there and go CHJ, CHJ, CHJ until they're asked to recall. But by giving them an additional task that keeps them from rehearsing those letters, and so we can uh, see how long those letters stay in short-term memory uh, when they are kept from rehearsing those letters. So it's a rehearsal prevention task, or we call it a distractor task. They're distracted from rehearsing. Uh, so that distractor task lasted for 3, 6, 9, 12, 15, or 18 seconds. And we call that the retention interval. Anytime we present a stimulus and then have a time period and then a recall task, we call that time period a retention interval because it's the length of time we, are try we want to see what people can retain. So what are they retaining over that interval? So in this case, it's from 3 to 18 seconds uh, is what the retention interval was. And as I said before, uh, this is often referred to as a Brown-Peterson task. So I just want to show you what this looks like. There'll be just two of these demonstrations, so just kind of follow along with me and try to do this so you can see what this is like. I'm going to present you with um, three consonants, which will then be followed by a number. You should count backwards by threes until Q to stop, and then you can write them down or just see if you can remember them. All right, so here we go. So count backwards by threes. And then write down those letters. And the correct answer then was Q W T. So now take a look at these letters and then count backwards by threes. And again, try to recall those letters. The correct answer here was Z, C, L. Um, now, obviously, I did this rough, just counted it in my head to get through a time interval, but the first one was about six seconds, and the second one was about 15 seconds. It gives you a sense of what this was like. Um, there are plenty of demonstrations for war online that you can do, um, and I will post some links to those as well. So what Peterson and Peterson found is that the proportion of correct trials in which participants could recall the letters uh, declined as a function of retention interval. So we go from 3 seconds to 18 seconds, and performance is terrible. Really at about 12 seconds, um, it sort of bottoms out. <coughs> Pardon me. And so um, we went to down to 5% after 18 seconds. Uh, and the conclusion was that information was rapidly decaying from short-term memory. So the duration of short-term memory in this case, maybe 12, 12 seconds or so, uh, according to this view. The assumption was that that counting backwards wasn't interfering with the letters. Um, and if you keep in mind, when uh, participants were doing these tasks, they don't just do one or two. They do dozens of them, They're sitting there for you know, like an hour doing just this. And so after a while, there's a lot of letters and a lot of numbers, and it can get confusing. And so there are people who believed um, that it was interference that was occurring. So uh, the longer the retention interval, the more the interference. So they used the same task as Peterson and Peterson. Uh, each participant completed three trials with retention intervals of 3, 9, or 18 seconds. And what they found was that performance was near perfect on that first trial, regardless of retention interval. And here's what that looked like. So uh, the top line here is the shorter retention interval. This is the medium retention interval, and this is the longer retention interval, so 3, 9, and 18 seconds. Well, everyone's performing pretty much at ceiling right here at the first trial. Now, over the longer retention intervals, performance declines on the second and third trial, and then it would probably continue going on had they gone out further. And so what you see, actually, is we're getting increased increasing interference over those longer retention intervals compared to the shorter retention intervals. And so averaged out over you know, dozens of trials, 
that's what was happening uh, over the long run in the Peterson and Peterson and Brown studies. Uh, so you can take a closer look at that here. So within three trials, they go from almost 100% down to 50%. By trial 50, uh, they were probably way down uh, into lower retention intervals. So this is a problem for decay theory and certainly supports the idea that what's happening in that Peterson and Peterson and the Brown studies are that you're actually getting an increase in interference from those longer retention intervals. And so uh, that's what's responsible for that uh, decreasing performance is a buildup of interference. So then we get uh, Wickens and colleagues uh, who uh, did a very clever study on what we call the release from proactive interference. Very similar design to Kepler and Underwood. Uh, they have a control group that received the same type of stimulus across four trials, um, which would be all consonants or all digits. And then in an experimental group, the type of stimulus was switched on the fourth trial. And so they would go from consonants to digits or digits back to, or over to consonants. So they would switch from one thing to the other. And here's what we see. In the control group, performance continues to decline um, the more trials they do. But in the experimental group, when we switch the stimulus type, we get this sudden uh, dramatic increase in performance. And we call that the release from proactive interference. Because uh, after trial three, from switching from trial three to trial four, uh, the participants in the experimental group uh, are no longer uh, looking at consonants, are no longer looking at digits. They've switched to the other. And now they no longer have the interference of those previous trials of digits or those previous trials of consonants. So that buildup and release of proactive interference was a really critical um, phenomenon for uh, Wickens and colleagues to discover. And so what we now think about is that over the long term, in these short-term memory experiments, what was happening was increasing and increasing builds up, buildups of uh, interference in short-term memory. So the conclusion then is that uh, interference seems to be the primary mode of uh, loss of information from short-term memory. Uh, there are additional experiments um, supporting this area. There's a very uh, clever study by Juan Norman using what's called the probe digit task. You can look that up. It's really a pretty clever technique for that. Uh, but for now, I want to move on to talk about the nature of the code. And this does. Um, get right at this question of interference as well. So uh, the question of the code is, how is that information represented? And Conrad did some interesting research where he presented participants with strings of letters followed by an immediate recall test. And he found that participants were making a lot of acoustic confusion errors. That is, they would recall items that sounded like those on the list, D, E, V, G, uh, that have very M, N, very similar sounds to them even though they look very different structurally um, because again they were being uh, they were studying these items into short-term memory and uh, were getting these were or words sorry these letters that sounded alike confused and they made very rare visual confusions so they didn't mistake e for f or w for v but only made sound-based confusions and so the conclusion then is that short-term memory is sound-based, that it is an acoustic code, that is, we store information based on its sounds. And when we get to working memory, we're going to talk about how this relates to what's called the phonological loop. And that's uh, an important component of uh, the working memory uh, model of shorter-term uh, versions of memory. So finally, the question gets at, what is the capacity of short-term memory? And this is another classic area of research um, by uh, George Miller back in uh, the 1950s. So uh, when we talk about uh, capacity of short-term memory, we're talking about memory span, so the longest sequence that a person can typically recall in, in this kind of task. So typically we do what's called a digit span task. So we present a sequence of two to ten digits and measure the number of items participants can recall in order. Essentially it's like trying to remember a phone number and it's not, it's not coincidental that your phone numbers are seven digits long because your capacity of short-term memory is seven digits, plus or minus two. <coughs> so um, using these span tasks, uh, you do this, present participants with a number of different trials and find out at what point uh, they're able to remember a span perfectly, at what point are they remembering 50% of the trials, and then you can get an idea of what their memory span is. And again, there are a number of different kinds of span tasks. The digit span task is the simplest of these. 
series of random digits. Participants remember them in the order they were presented. There's also word span, letter span, um, and so these are fairly straightforward span tasks. When we get to talking about working memory, we'll talk about reverse digit span and how that's different, involves a different kind of processing. And we'll talk about another span task called the operation span task, um, which is a particularly important measure of working memory capacity. But in these classic um, span tasks, simply here are some digits, remember them in order. And George Miller, in his uh, very famous paper called The Magical Number 7, found that regardless of stimulus type, the typical short-term memory span is about seven plus or minus two items. So seven digits, seven letters, seven words, all of that right about seven plus or minus two items. And that's basically the reason why our phone numbers are seven digits, because this is our capacity of short-term memory. You know, back when people actually had to remember phone numbers. Now finally, uh, I want to uh, talk about how the capacity of short-term memory can be increased through a phenomenon called chunking. So it's seven things that you're supposed to remember. So let's say you were supposed to remember this list of letters. C-A, T-B-U, S-R, A-T-T-O, G. Seems like it's really difficult, right? Until we change those letters and chunk them. So it's the same letters, same order. If we say C-A-T, B-U-S, R-A-T, D-O-G, we go from 16 things to remember, which we had here, to four things to remember. And so we have chunked them into sort of digestible bits. And so it makes it so we only have four things to remember, four chunks to remember, instead of 16 individual letters. Um, so the question is then, sort of what do we think of as an item when we talk about having seven um, items in short-term memory? Well, it's how we sort of form them together. And there are people who are sort of super mnemonicists who have this ability to remember things like digits by remembering digits that are related to other things, like there's an avid runner who ties everything to you know running time, so what's the world record in the 50 meter dash or 50 yard dash or whatever they are, um, the 500 meter uh, in the marathon or you know that sort of thing. And so he's able to take those numbers that he knows so well in his long-term memory and use those as chunks. Um, and so that's how uh, people who have, sometimes people who have these large working memory capacities or short-term memory capacities uh, do so by chunking information. And so you can do this yourself if you're trying to remember something, by trying to get it into digestible, easy to remember pieces rather than a whole bunch of things uh, tied together. Uh, and that's, that's the basic idea there. All right, well that gets us to the end of our introduction to uh, short-term memory. We will um, Next, be talking about working memory models of memory uh, in our next lecture.